chapter 4. Boy, it's hard to follow that kind of introduction. But it's easy for me to agree with Brother Rex that we have become close friends, dear friends through the years. I've tried to figure it up, Rex, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly about the date, but somewhere around 47 years ago. And that's a long time. And I'm looking at it, it's a bunch of young folks. That's, <laughs> that's longer than many of you are old. <laughs> but uh, Rex has been a blessing, he and Martha, Sister Martha, uh, to me and my wife through the years. Uh, we have uh, pastored fairly close together. We've pastored distances apart we've not always had the opportunity to fellowship together as we would have liked to but they have been always been so special and uh, those trips back and forth to school uh, we did learn a lot in those discussions it's amazing uh, how much you can learn from discussing the word of God with others who love the word of God and uh, Rex is very special. I am so honored today to have been invited to preach on Pastor Appreciation Day. And uh, I can say without reservation, I appreciate this brother. And I know that, that you appreciate him as your pastor. But I get to preach to him today. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it. If you found your place in the scriptures in the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, if you will please come down in the chapter to verse 10. I'm not going to preach an expository message as such, but I want to base what I'm going to say. And by the way, uh, Brother Rex, the, the day you called me, I hung up the phone and began writing, and the Holy Spirit gave me this message right then and there. No question about it. This is what God wanted preached today. I, I want to use this, this passage as the text basis for the message. And I'll be using several other scriptures along during the message. And for time's sake, I'm not going to give you time to turn to those passages. I don't like to do that because I, I, I like to have people follow along the various scriptures but uh, so that, that you will make know that I'm not making something up, but this is what God's word says. But I'm using a lot of different scriptures, and uh, for time's sake, maybe you'll just jot down the reference. And then when you get home this afternoon, check those references out. If I said something wrong, tell your pastor. He'll get me straightened out. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to try this without the glasses. Let's see how, how well we can do. Ephesians 4, verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. And we'll pause the reading there with verse 13, reading verses 10 through 13 in this fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. I need to pray, but before I pray, I want to point out some things in this passage to you. Notice that this passage, without any debate whatsoever, I, Brother Rex, I don't know of any so-called scholars that would debate what I'm about to say, uh, tells us that God himself, uh, the Lord Jesus, uh, after he ascended back to the Father in his uh, right place at the right hand of God the Father, uh, gave gifts to men. And he enumerates those gifts here uh, in this 11th verse. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, 
and pastors and teachers. And he gave them to the church, these gifted individuals, for a purpose. Now, if you miss this, you'll not, never be the kind of church member that you need to be. In fact, you'll never be the kind of Christian that God saved you to be if you miss what I'm about to point out to you in this passage of Scripture. The purpose of these gifted individuals is listed here in verse 12 for the perfecting of the saints. That word perfecting in the King James translation has an underlying meaning in its Greek equivalent and that means maturing. Have you ever seen a person that Oh, they may be 40, 45 years old, but they still act like a kid. They just never grow up. These gifted individuals are given to the church to mature the saints, and the saints are those that are Jesus followers. By the way, this would be a good point for me to pause and ask a question. Are you a Jesus follower? If you are a Christian and you're not following Jesus... Who are you following? Christians are supposed to follow Jesus. So these gifted individuals are given for the maturing of saved folks. And then it goes on and expresses more. For the work of the ministry. You know, we use the terminology sometimes, so-and-so has entered the ministry. <laughs> you're a Christian, you're supposed to be in the ministry. Every single born-again, blood-washed believer should be involved in spreading the gospel, in living the gospel, in demonstrating the gospel in their life. That's what a Christ follower is. So these gifted individuals, which, by the way, since this is Pastor Appreciation Day, includes the pastors, is to mature the saints for the work of the ministry. You see, the preacher can't do but so much. He's only one person. But I don't know. I'm looking out here. I'm guessing there's probably, what, Rex, 50, 60 people here this morning. Every one of you that are a Christian are supposed to be ministering the gospel, doing the work of spreading the good news that Jesus came, tempted in all points that any human has ever been tempted, yet refused to give in to temptation and disobey his heavenly father, yet took upon himself the guilt of all persons and paid the penalty on an old rugged cross. And that's the message that we're supposed to be carrying. And then it goes on for the edifying of the body of Christ. That word edifying means build up. How are you going to build up the church? Tell people about Jesus. Bring people to the point that they recognize they're sinners. And they don't want to go to hell. And they want to honor God and glorify Him. And so they receive Jesus Christ. And then they become a part of the church. If you've never received Jesus Christ, you can go to church every Sunday. You can go every Wednesday. You can go every day of the week. But if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian. And Christians... Have a purpose. And here the Bible gives that purpose. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13. Till we all. I had a student one time. Brother Rex asked me. When did all not mean all? I tried to show how smart I was. I said when it's used as a hyperbole. I remember the first time I ever heard that word. I had to go home and get my dictionary to look it up. I'd never heard it before. <laughs> a deliberate exaggeration. Well, it's not a hyperbole here. It means every Christ follower, including the pastor, until we all, all, all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
In other words, one of the pastor's responsibility is to teach the Word of God and preach the Word of God in such a way that these young folks can understand it, in, in a way that educated folks can understand it, in, in the way that ordinary folks like us can understand it and trust in Jesus and model our life after the teachings of God's Word until we become like Jesus. That's the purpose of being saved. That we might grow spiritually to become tomorrow more like Jesus than we are today. Maturing, growing in our understanding and knowledge of God's word. Until we come to the measure of the fullness of the statue of Christ. Now, that being said, I need to pray. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you gave your son Jesus, that you loved us enough to give him that we might have a relationship with you. But Father, you've gone beyond just giving us that wonderful relationship. You've given us a purpose for living, and that is that our life might make a difference, that you might receive glory, and that Jesus might be reflected in us, that all who observe our life might recognize there's something different and that difference is Jesus Father I need your anointing to preach I trust you to give what I need that I might give what you've given me to deliver may your Holy Spirit have his way in each of us in Jesus name Amen is this water for me? Thank you. I need it. I went for many years up until the last year or so and never needed water in the pulpit. That's what the years will do for you. Today is Pastor Appreciation Day. And I know you, I, it wouldn't it be good for me to have been able to get in touch with someone and and just secretly get the word out. And I'd say, how many of you appreciate your pastor? And nobody said a word. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you, Rex. <laughs> I know you appreciate your pastor because I know this man and I know how much he loves you. And it's a day to honor your pastor. And I want to have a part. And I am so thankful that, that Rex has honored me uh, by inviting me to preach today. But he deserves our honor not because of who he is but because of what he is. You see, this, this man over here with the help of this lady that's seated next to him is a man of God. And that's why you should appreciate him. Sure, you should honor him because he's the pastor. And the Bible gives the pastor a, a certain position and, and commands that he be honored for the position. But you should desire to honor this man because of what he is, not who he is. He is a man of God, a man who serves God, a man who loves God. I want to preach today about the characteristics of a man of God. What, what is it about this man that gives me the, the right to say that he is a man of God? Well, I've chosen four different individuals in the scripture that I want to use as examples, biblical examples of what are the characteristics of a man of God? Now, you might think, oh, he, he's going to talk about Jesus. See, I'm going to talk about him, but I'm, Jesus is not one of the four individuals. You see, Jesus is not a man of God. He's the God-man. He's perfect. The Bible commands us to strive for perfection, to become more and more and more like Jesus. 
But I've chosen four different biblical individuals. And the first one is the man Abraham. It is said of Abraham that he believed God. Now, I didn't say he believed in God. I said he believed God. In Psalms chapter 14 and Psalms chapter 53, the first verse in both of those references, the Bible says the same thing. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, there are people around today who would tell you, oh, this thing about God is a fairy tale. There's no such thing as a God. They're a fool. To look at this creation, to look at this world, to look at the intricacies of what we call nature, the handiwork of God, and believe that that just happened? I don't think so. <laughs> I was teaching a class one year at school on biblical creationism, and I was subbing for the regular teacher. But I came in and I, I had me a, a cardboard box and a peck bucket. And I think you folks are country enough so you know what a peck bucket is. And I set them both on the table and began my lecture. And as I went along, I would reach in that cardboard box and I'd pull out some dirt and I'd throw it in that bucket. I, after a while, I'd pull out a handful of nails I'd throw in that bucket. After a while, I'd pull out a little bottle of water and I'd pour that in the bucket. And I went along doing that different things I poured in the bucket. And when I got down to the end of the class, I said, now I want to show you something. I picked that bucket up, and I, I shook it around, and I shook it up and down, and I reached in, and I pulled out a pocket watch. I said, now, if you believe that pocket watch wasn't in that bucket before I started, you're a fool. <laughs> and if you think that, that, that this world evolved, you're a fool. It takes a fool not to realize that there has to be a intelligent designer uh, more powerful uh, than any human that could cause this world this universe to exist but the bible tells us that that intelligent designer's name is jehovah god who manifests himself in the person of his son jesus christ and who is at work even today right now in this moment in the person of the holy spirit no, I'm talking about Abraham not only believed in God, he believed God. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, we have the first recording of what we call the Abrahamic covenant. When God came to this man, he was called Abram at this time. Later on, God changed his name to Abraham. So I'm going to call him Abraham. God came to Abraham and said, I, I want you to leave your family and I want you to go into a land that I'll show you. And I want you to serve me and me alone. And if you'll do that, I'll bless you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll make you a, your name great. And I'll make the whole world blessed because of you. The three elements of the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham lived in a land where... Possibly, every person had become an idolater. Even his own daddy worshipped idols. And God said, I want you to get away from that and go. He didn't even tell Abraham where he was going. He said, I'll let you know when you get there. And Abraham said, oh, well, I think I will. Now, I've often wondered, Brother Rex, what would have happened if Abraham had said, well, now, God, I believe every word you said. And I, I believe you, well, no matter what you say. But I, I sort of like my home. And I don't know where I'm going, and those folks might not like me. Now, I believe you, God. I believe you. But I, I thank you, sir. I think I'll stay right here. You think God would have counted Abraham's belief for righteousness? No, you see, Abraham believed God, and because he believed God, he acted on it. We have a lot of folks, in, even in church houses today, who say, oh, I believe God, 
but they don't live like it. Abraham believed God and did what God said. Now later on in chapter 15 of Genesis, Abraham starts complaining to God. Sounds like a crowd of free will Baptists to me. He said, God, I don't have any children. And you promised to, to, to make me a, a great nation. And how am I going to have uh, become a great nation if I don't have any children? Abraham's getting old. He's getting concerned. And God makes a promise to Abraham. He said, Abraham, look up into the sky and look at the stars. Can you count number those stars? I'm going to make your descendants more numerous than the stars. And the Bible says there in that 15th chapter of Genesis, and Abraham believed God and he counted it unto him for righteousness. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you believe God? I didn't say do you believe in God. Do you believe God? When God makes a promise, do you believe he'll keep it? When God says, do this, do you believe it to the extent you'll do it? Oh, it may seem ridiculous. It may seem impossible. But if God said, do it, are you willing to do it? I'm seeing some folks nod yes. I like that, Brother Rex. Well, if you... Believe God, why not start living like it? Why not start taking God at his word? By the way, just in case you didn't know, that's the definition of faith. Taking God at his word and acting on it. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that without faith it's impossible to please God. Abraham Believe God. And a man that is a man of God will believe what God says and act on it. Then quickly, not only do I want to call your attention to Abraham as an example of a man of God, I want to call your attention to a man named Moses. Moses was an interesting individual. The Jews, even in Israel today, talk about Moses constantly. The great lawgiver, the great man of God. You know what made Moses such a man of God? Moses chose to forsake the pleasures of sin and follow God. You may remember the story of how uh, the Egyptian Pharaoh uh, looked at the Israelites who were living, sojourning in the land of Egypt. And they were becoming more powerful, more populated than the Egyptians. So the Pharaoh issued an order that all the male babies should be put to death. And so little baby Moses' mother took him and put him in this little basket and put him out in the Nile River and trusted God to look after him. Well, wouldn't you know, along comes Pharaoh's daughter. She sees the basket out in the river and has her servants fetch it, and there's a little baby. And she took that baby into her home and reared that little boy just like he was her own child. He became a prince of Egypt, one, a, 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 a contender to the very throne. He, he possibly could have become the Pharaoh. And at that time in history, Egypt was the most powerful country in the world. Moses grew up with all the privileges and prestige and, and all the play. Anything he wanted was his. But Moses realized that he was not an Egyptian. He was a Hebrew. And the time came when he had to make a decision. Am I going to still live in the pleasures of the royalty of Egypt? Or am I going to live God's way? And in the scriptures, in, in the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament, chapter 11, in verse 24, the scripture says, by faith, what did I say faith was? 
taking God in his word and acting on him. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There came a time when Moses had to make a choice, indulge himself with the pleasures of Egypt, while he was a prince, he could do anything he wanted to. Have anything he wanted. He could have as much gold as he wanted. He could have as many women as he wanted. He was a prince of Egypt. He could have anything he wanted. But he chose not to follow the ways of the world, but to follow the ways of God. Amen. Oh, by the way, what choice have you made? Are you following the ways of the world? Or are you following the ways of God? Oh, listen, Rick, since I've been retired from pastoring, I visit a lot of churches representing the school, filling the pulpit for a pastor and so forth. I see a lot of church folks that act like the world, look like the world, smell like the world. We are Christ followers, church. And we're supposed to be following God's way, not the world's way. We've got churches scattered all around. I'm talking about free will Baptist churches. Shame on us. They've got different colored lights, smoke machines. They've got eight or ten people up on the stage with guitars, and they're dancing and jumping and all that. Performing. Putting on a show. That's the ways of the world. Amen. Has no place in the house of God. But there are a lot of people today that call themselves, you hear what I said? They call themselves <laughs> Christians. But they're following the ways of the world and not the ways of God. Moses was a man of God because he chose to follow God's way and forsake the world's way. Abraham was a man of God because he took God at his word and acted on it very quickly. David, we all know David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. David wrote more of the Psalms than any other single writer. This book of Psalms is, is Israel's songbook. David was a God said, I didn't say this, God said it. David was a man after God's own heart. You remember the story about little David? Little David was out tending his father's sheep. The Bible doesn't tell us how old he was, but when you study the scriptures carefully, you get the idea David was somewhere about 15, 16, 17 years old. He was a teenager. But David loved God. And here's what made David a, a man of God. David trusted God. He didn't trust him on his own self. He didn't trust his daddy. He didn't trust his brothers. David trusted God. The Philistines were making war. With the children of Israel. David's brothers were in the army. His daddy told him to take some food up to where the battle was for his brothers. When David got there, he was shocked. The Philistines had a giant. Bible scholars say that Goliath was about 13 feet tall. Boy, I'd love to have him on a basketball team. 13 feet tall, giant. I have a friend that I come up to his armpits. He's seven feet five. <laughs> Can you imagine 13 feet tall? And guess what Goliath was doing? He was challenging the armies of Israel and making fun of their God. And little David comes along and he hears that. 
and pour his blood starts to boil. Righteous indignation. And he says, why isn't somebody doing something to, to this heathen uh, for insulting God? His brother said, hush, David. Hush, David. David said, I'm not about to hush. I'm going to kill that giant. I'm sure that some of the people laughed at David. <laughs> yeah. How do you think you're going to kill? In fact, King Saul asked David, how do you think you, you understand? I'm paraphrasing here. How do you think you're going to kill that giant when our whole army is scared of him? David said, I was out looking after my father's sheep, and along came a bear, and along came a lion. And they took a, a, a lamb in, in their mouth, and were going to take them away and eat them. He said, but I ran, and I grabbed hold of them, and I killed both of them. And the same God that delivered my lambs and me from the bear and the lion will deliver me from that uncircumcised heathen. Amen. And David got him a little round, smooth river rock, and he put it in his sling, and he came out to Goliath. And Goliath saw that little teenager, and he laughed at him. He said, am I some kind of dog you see children after me? About time he said that, David let that rock fly. Bam! Knocked him out. David ran over where Goliath was laying, grabbed his sword, and with both hands and a mighty whack, he cut his head off. You see, here was a, a young lad, didn't have a lot of physical maturity, but he had something that a lot of adults don't have. He trusted God Amen. in spite of, of the circumstance. We're going through some difficult days right now. This pandemic. Brother Jamie Coates, Rex mentioned. Praying for Jamie, his wife too. Both have COVID. Jamie has been suffering for several years now from an incurable disease. He should have already died. It's called myasthenia gravis. He's having a crisis attack of that. He has the COVID virus. He has, probably from coughing so much, two broken ribs. They drew four pints of fluid off his chest the uh, day before yesterday. It was causing congestive heart failure. And I sent him a, a message through uh, Facebook Messenger yesterday, and I said, uh, Jamie, you, your faith is amazing. Keep on trusting God. He won't let you down. And he responded. And thank me for saying that. He said, I've got a battle to fight. I've got a mountain to climb. But it's a whole lot easier climbing that mountain when you have the maker of the mountain by your side. Do you trust God? Even in these, a lot of people have lost their jobs. What are we going to do? The temptation there is to take matters into our own hands and do the wrong thing. But David was a man of God because he didn't trust in anything but God. The idea that he could kill that giant was absurd. But David believed in a God that spoke the universe into existence. And David was a man of God because he trusted God. And Moses was a man of God because he chose God's way instead of the world's way. And Abraham was a man of God because he believed God and acted on it. One more, real quick. In the New Testament, a man we call the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a man of God. Listen now, I'm about to look. Because he sought to do the will of God. His name was Saul. That was his Hebrew name. When he carried the gospel later into the Gentile world, they called him by his Greek equivalent to Saul, which is Paul. And so I'll call him Paul. Paul did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And he set about to destroy the church. He, he did everything he could to hurt the church. Sounds like what's going on in the United States nowadays. But he had an encounter one day 
with a man named Jesus. And when Jesus interrupted Paul, Paul cried out, listen, what wilt thou have me to do, Lord? And Paul spent the rest of his life, the rest of his life, seeking to do the will of God. Oh, sometimes it put him in prison. Sometimes it called him, called him to be beaten. In fact, one time, I believe, he died and God brought him back to life. But his whole life, his main object when he got up every day, how can I do what God saved me to do today? Oh, by the way, did you know that's what every Christian ought to do? Did you know that God saved you to do his will? That God expects you to make the number one purpose in your life not to be the best deer hunter, not to be the best mechanic, not to be the, 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 the best scientist. He saved you to be the best Christian that you're capable of being and even beyond your capability with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this man Paul wrote, if, if, if he is the writer in the only book in the New Testament, we don't know who the human instrument was that recorded it, is the book of Hebrews. If, if Paul was the writer of Hebrews, he wrote over half of the New Testament. God used that man. You know why God used him so much? Because Paul wanted more than anything else to do what God wanted him to do. Paul was a man of God because his number one purpose in life was to do the will of God. You know why Paul wanted to do that? Because he knew doing the will of God demonstrated his faith, showed his priority, demonstrated in whom he trusted, and would bring glory to his Lord. These are the characteristics of a man of God. Listen carefully. These are the characteristics of Rex and Martha Edwards. And I believe that, brother, from the bottom of my heart. He is a man of God. She is a lady of God. Because their life demonstrates these biblical examples of men of God. Now here's my, my argument. Where do you fit into all this? Do you remember back in Ephesians? I emphasize that God gave these gifted individuals, pastors is one of them, to mature us, to instruct us, till we all, not just the pastor, till we all mature into the fullness of the statue of Jesus Christ. Every Christian here, every Christ follower here, this sermon could have been preached about you. And if it couldn't, do something about it. Do something about it. And if you're not a Christian, oh my, that's another sermon. You don't want to know what's going to happen in your life. But today, if you're not a Christian, you can do something about that too. You can trust Jesus, invite him into your life to be your Savior, to be your Lord. Today would be a good day to do that.
So church, why don't you make that commitment today? I want to be known as a man of God. I want to be known as a woman of God. I want these characteristics to be characteristics of my life. And if you're not a Christian, why don't you become one today? Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for your holy, precious word. I pray, Father, that you would take the broken words of this preacher and speak to our understanding. And God, stir us emotionally that we, we might recognize how much you love us and how much you want to bless us and, and how much you want to honor us and give us, Father, that desire to do your will, to trust you, to claim your promises, to be the people of God. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the pastor if he'll stand down front. I don't know what your policy is about social distancing, but you've got a lot of room up here. If you would like for these characteristics to be the characteristics in your life, why don't you just come up here as the musicians are preparing a hymn of invitation. Just come up here and stand and pray. If you want to say, speak to the pastor, he'd love for you to. If you're not a Christian, he'd love to introduce you to Jesus. How about it this morning? We stand together. <laughs>